Hi, I'm David Henry Huang for the American Theater Wing. Today's show takes place at an extraordinary moment. This fall's Broadway season features seven new plays, all by American authors, with more to come. So I'm excited to be talking today with two of the most important voices in American theater, both working currently on Broadway. Lydia Diamond's Diamond's career began in Chicago, where she won a Jeff Award for Voyeurs de Venus. Her plays, including Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Stage Black, and an adaptation of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, have been staged around the country, and her play Stick Fly will mark her Broadway debut. Susan Laurie Park's plays include Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom, Venus, In the Blood, Fucking A, The Book of Grace, and Top Dog Underdog, for which she won the 2002 Pulitzer Prize in Drama. She's the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, and her new book for the Gershwins, Porgy and Bess is currently previewing on Broadway. And I'm very happy that my new play, English, (laughs) is also part of this Broadway season. Thanks to you both for joining me. Thanks Thanks for having us. Let's start by talking about how each of you became a playwright. Were you always interested in theater, or did you just sort of fall into the field? Um, it took me a full 10 years of being a professional playwright in Chicago, and by professional I mean writing and mounting and being in my own little little shows at Café Voltaire in the basement of a vegetarian restaurant and churches and storefront theaters. Um, but I actually went to school, I went to Northwestern to be an actor, and I was um, so overwhelmed um, by the um, uh, roles available to me. Not that they didn't exist, but that they were so not a part of the standard canon that's given to you, or at least was given to me academically. Uh, It was before you could Google, like, what are the great roles for black women, and everybody would pop up. So I didn't quite have the sophistication to find the plays that existed already. So I'm not presumptuous enough to think that I invented complicated, neurotic, complex, flawed, funny characters, um, but at the time I thought they needed to be created. So I started writing so that I could play roles that um, had a certain amount of depth and complexity that I wasn't finding, and also contemporary. I was having a hard time finding plays with black people sharing a stage with people of other colors and sexual orientations and classes. And um, and so that's kind of how I got started. So were you in your early plays? I, 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 yes. And I don't know why I'm embarrassed about that, but yes, it was a bit of a vanity thing for a, a very little while. And then what happened is that it became clear to me um, that I didn't enjoy acting. My husband actually pointed that out. He's like, you know, you, you get really miserable when you're doing a play. And I thought, oh, you know what I could do? I could stop doing that. And, and so that's when I <laughs> actually called myself a playwright. Wow. So, yeah. Susan Laurie, I know you're a, you're a musician. Yeah. I've heard you play and sing, and yeah. you're really good at it. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> and yeah, I just saw her at Joe's, Joe's Pub the other day. Um, oh, you were there. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and, um, but you were, were you an actor? Well, I was a, a writer, and I had the good fortune of taking a writing class with James Baldwin, who happened to be the writer in residence at a college near Mount Holyoke College, at Hampshire College. I took his class. And whenever it was my turn to read my short stories, I was really, really animated, like blah, 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 like that. And they were just short stories. So at one point he said, Miss Parks, have you ever thought about writing for the theater? <laughs> and I was like, and I thought he was saying, you know, get thee to a theater, like you're a failure as a short story writer. So I was like totally crushed and devastated. Um, but I started writing my first play that day. And that's how I got into the theater. So. Yeah. So he would be a particular sort of mentor that really kind of kicked you, either got you started or kind of kicked you to the next yeah, level. Yeah, and I wish, I really wish he, because he died in, what, 87 or something like that, and um, just you shortly after he get to see been, it. No, and I, you know, and I was just moving to New York and just getting started as a playwright, so I would have just loved to, to have, you know, other, you know, more conversations with him about playwriting because he'd done playwriting too, and he was just an amazing presence, so. Yeah. I, mean, I think mentoring is so uh, important in our field. I mean, I, I started writing plays in college just because um, I saw some plays my freshman year, right, and I right. thought, oh, I think I can do that. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. And then I started writing plays in my spare time, and I found a professor named John Leroux, who's actually uh-huh. a novelist, oh. but John was willing to take a look at them, and he told me they were really bad, which they were, <laughs> uh, but my problem <laughs> was that 
I, um, you know, I wanted to write plays, but I didn't actually know anything about the theater. Right. Uh, but then John set up this whole program for me, so I could yeah. see as many plays and read as many plays as I could. Yeah. And you know, eventually, I wrote my first play my senior year. But you know, I, I feel like to be able to keep in touch with those people. I mean, oh I, I've been able to keep in I touch know. with John over the years. Yeah. I invited him to the opening of Chinglish, but you know, really? his, his, his health is not oh, okay. uh, was, was, did not permit that. But it's. Yeah, I, and do you have like someone like oh, that in your I life? Oh, I have so many people like that. Um, my first playwriting teacher was Charles Smith, who's mm -hmm. a wonderful playwright and actually runs the playwriting program at um, Ohio. Uh -huh. um, he and Chuck Smith, uh, the director in Chicago who, who directs at the Goodman, um, were, I would credit as being huge mentors of mine. Uh, Russ Tuttero, who's uh, the artistic director at Chicago Dramatist. There, it just seems that the Shirley Joe Finney, a wonderful um, director who also has this great dramaturgical flair. Mm -hmm. Ed Sobel, my favorite dramaturg at the Steppenwolf, who's now at the Arden. It just goes on and on and on. I feel like it's so much about, oh my God. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing when you start naming the names of the people who've helped you grow creatively and professionally. Emily Mann and the McCarter Theatre Company, they've just right. held me and um, taught me, Emily's taught me so much about empowering myself as a playwright and sort of what that means, stepping into your, your, your um, authority, I suppose, both in a process and even more so professionally. Mm -hmm. So there's so many people. Yeah, I also have Sam Shepard and, I, and Maria Irene Fernandez. <laughs> And I feel like they wow. really yeah. began to teach me yeah. how to write more from my unconscious. Oh. And that helped me find my voice. Is, is there a, a moment, I mean, as you're writing along and you're a young writer, mm -hmm. sometimes there is a moment or a play or uh, an incident that makes you feel like I, I, you're finding something unique to yourself. You're finding your voice, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Does that, do you guys have any experience with that? Or is there a moment you can identify, or, or do you feel like it's all sort of a, uh, been a continuous process? Yeah, I, I think that while the voice changes, I mean, maybe not for every writer, but again, we're talking about just what we've gone through, but as the writing voice changes, grows, and mutates throughout your career, um, or mine has anyway so far, I think that there are moments where you can, or there are like touchstones or hot spots or crossroads, you know, that we all have, and you go, whoa, that was when my, I felt my finger in the socket, you know, kind of thing. And for me, one of the early moments after so I was writing this, you know, writing this play uh, that James Baldwin told me to write, and uh, I have to mention, I, sorry, I have to sidebar, I have to mention George C. Wolfe, mm -hmm. um, someone who is just We're wonderful and we love. We'll have to keep doing that <laughs> as we go on. <laughs> yeah, like George C. Wolfe, it's Saki Shange. We can just keep oh, naming Shange people. Oh, it's Saki Shange, right, okay. Well, well, we can keep naming people. Um, but anyway, there's a, yeah, there was a there was a, an early moment that um, and the tricky thing is with with these moments, you sometimes we try to replicate them as writers, which might be good and might not be so good. But you look for that thing. That's when it's real. You yeah. think when it's ringing like that. But yeah, when the first moment where I actually there's writing, you know, when you're writing along a typewriter or by hand or whatever or a computer, and then there's when you're not writing at all when you're actually hearing the voices and you're actually just taking dictation. And when the first time that, that happened to me, I was like, oh man, this is awesome. You know, and you're not writing at all. And that's when I thought, oh, maybe I am a writer. Not that mm -hmm. all writers have to have that experience or whatever, but, but that's, yeah. That's the sweet spot. It's yeah, true. It is. Um, I think I was lucky because I didn't identify as a, a playwright mm -hmm. very early. Mm -hmm. And so I had the freedom to sort of not ever feel... Uh, terribly self-consciously literary mm -hmm. and I didn't have to go through that stage that I sometimes see young writers go through of kind of needing to emulate uh, take sort of take turns emulating different playwrights right. so I, right. I sort of stumbled upon whatever you would call your voice because obviously mm -hmm. uh, the voice that is my voice now is not the one that was when I was this brazen 22 year old who thought I knew everything and knew nothing <laughs> um, I've also noticed how, for me, the place that I write from, the location of um, where I'm writing from has changed considerably. And I kind of feel right now, I think, at a crossroads creatively, I used to write from a place of utter conviction and um, 
a lot of anger and a lot of, of um, a sense that there was something that needed to be said, a sense of urgency. And now having had a child and um, uh, many, many years later, I'm finding that I'm learning how to write from a place of sort of humble, not knowing and questioning and that that can be as active mm -hmm. and as um, important and potent as the <clears throat> kind of mm -hmm. kind of place that I, I was used to writing from. Well, which is a good segue to talking about craft, really, mm -hmm. because, you know, different people have different things that kind of motivate them to begin writing a new play. Like, why does one choose to write about this and not that? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, my, my trigger is very similar to yours, yeah. I, I, to your new one, in the sense that it's really something that I don't understand. I have a question, mm -hmm. and I write the play to find out how I feel about it deep inside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then you have, I've heard Edward Albee speak once, and he talked about he wakes up at some point and discovers he's with play, you know, right. and he uses right. the pregnancy analogy. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, I mean, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's that I have a question. Right. And then number two, um, this goes to the question, like, how, how you get through the play, but I basically like to have a vague idea of where I'm starting and where I'm ending. Right. Not everybody, that, you know, has right. that. And then third, and this is funny that yeah. you mentioned that earlier. I do kind of take another play as a model. Mm -hmm. Almost okay. all my plays are kind of based on other plays. I think eventually right. they become their own thing. Right. Right. But it, it kind of is just like a jump start uh -huh. that helps uh -huh. me get going. Uh -huh. okay. um, but you know, yeah. like Pinter talks about. Okay, you, you know, he he used to talk about. Um, he had an image, right. you know, the room, two people, two people, and some sort of, and then what are they saying to each other? Right, right. Um, so do, right. You, do you know where you're going when you start a play, Susan Laurie? Well, I've always been lost. Mm -hmm. I've never had anything to say. Ne but maybe, you know, you know, you never know because the voice changes and mutates. So maybe one day I'll know more when I start and I'll have something to say. I mean, but I, but not, I, but I, no, I'm just why? trying to, I mean, I'm it, hoping, it seems maybe. to be working well for you. <laughs> it seems to be working well. But I sort of, I've always been um, I feel like it's like it's like you know, well I shouldn't say it here. No, there's nothing directly over my head, but you know, boom, something will fall on my head like an apple or a whatever, or or I'll feel like I'm called. And it's a joke now because that's how I got involved with Porgy and Bess. I mean, literally, it was a phone call. Mm -hmm. But um, but before that, it was always I felt like I had been called, and and that's how I say it. You know, I think we all sort of ha have a similar thing. We express it in different ways. But I, even with Top Dog, Under Dog, I didn't know, I knew, it started from a joke. Oh, it starts from a joke. Ha ha ha. Uh, fucking A in the blood started from a joke. I told a joke to a friend and. Do you remember any of the jokes? Oh yeah. Uh, I was in a canoe and we were in like Nantucket or something. And I was in a canoe, I was in the back of the canoe, we were paddling along and I said to my friend, I'm gonna write a riff on the Scarlet Letter and I'm gonna call it fucking A. And I thought that was the funniest joke I'd ever, <laughs> ha, 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 ha. So I'm laughing and we paddle back to shore and I get on shore and it was really that thing where you, 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 you're still feeling it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, the first thing I gotta do is read the Scarlet Letter because I never <laughs> read the Scarlet Letter. So Oh that's funny. I know well, right, <laughs> that, that might be the biggest joke of all. So yeah, so there you go, you know, and then in ca out came, you know, the two plays, in the blood and fucking a from that one joke. Top Dog Underdog was the same thing. Two brothers, Lincoln and Booth, but um bump. And I started laughing. I was hanging out with a friend, Emily Morris, who works at New Dramatist now. And I was laughing, 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 and she looked at me, she said, You better go home and write. I said, I know. And I go home, and I don't know what it, it's about or anything. I just kind of start, like, you know, walking in the dark or running in the dark. Or it, for me, it's yeah. characters. Um, yeah. Maybe yeah. because I'm an only child, um, I. Uh, it's going to sound a little pathetic, but I think I make up people that I want to hang out with. Uh -huh. I make uh -huh. up my yeah. friends, uh -huh. and um, and the more I know them, the more they tell me their life stories and their history. Um, the more I know which rooms I want for which of those friends mm -hmm. to be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then the rest of it, the sort of the, uh, their reason for being in a room and all of the things that we would call plot and all of the things we would call conflict kind of, kind of bubble up right away. And then structuring usually happens for me on the back end. What I think is interesting is that this play that's happening now, Stick Fly, is the first and only time, and I can't say that I'll ever do this again, that I, I kind of tried, it was my exercise actually in writing 
a very traditional play with very traditional parameters because I thought it would be fun uh -huh. and a challenge. Um, so I think that that's kind of interesting. And it, it sort of sort of kicked my ass around um, the structuring of it. It was a good, humbling exercise in, in um, the, um, the mechanics of making a play that functions that way. It's a good learning, learning curve. And was it more fun? N um, it, <laughs> it was more fun uh, thematically. Because I, I knew that I wanted, I knew that it was funny. I, I knew, I said, I'm going to write a play, and I think that there will be some, uh, a little bit of a love triangle, and I think some big stuff will happen, and they're all in a thing, and I, you know. And then what I found interesting is that the dark stuff that I'm always asking questions about, that I'm always uh, sort of either angry or perplexed and amused about, like, why we have such a hard time talking about race, why we have such a hard time talking about class, why all of these things happen over and over and over again. Those kind of made their way in anyway because those are the things that are most in me. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I enjoyed writing the play, but it was a different kind of enjoyment. OK, so once you have a first draft, um, I nowadays, I tend what to show you, it yeah. to, well, I sh um, sh either show it to Oscar Eustace, who, you know, at the I public, or I show it to, uh, and or mm -hmm. Lee Silverman, who's been my yeah. director now for yeah. a while. Um, my wife is usually helpful. Um, where do you go? Is there, do you have like a particular person that you when show it to? When I have my first draft? Yeah. Uh, I go to the drawer mm -hmm. and I put it in the drawer and I let it look at itself, <laughs> you know? And because I feel like it's, um, you know, I, I, I feel like it, it will look at itself and it marinates me. I was thinking of the cooking metaphor. It's a pie. It's a, it's a piece of meat that you marinate, or tofu, and you're marinating it in a drawer or something. And I let it marinate for maybe a week or two weeks or something, depending on how I'm feeling or what else I'm working on, because sometimes, you know, we all work on more than one thing at once, you know. And then I take it out of the drawer and I read it. And it tells me what I need to do next. So I, when I'm showing somebody a draft, like an early draft, I would say it's, it hasn't yet been, I, I've ne never really shown anybody a first draft. Oh, no, there was, oh, see, never, wrong. When I finished Top Dog Underdog, I typed the last words. I picked up the phone to Bonnie Metzger, who was then the associate producer, I think that's her title, at the Public Theater, and I said, Bonnie, I have a new play, can I have a reading? She said, yep. I said, okay. I'm sending it to you like that. So that was totally different. But do you ever show scenes to people like before it's finished? I do. I read them to my husband in bed. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it no, came out nice. sounding a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. embarrassing. Oh, no, 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 look. <laughs> yeah, great. no, but that's I read it to I read mm -hmm. scenes to my husband. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to have to hear it. I like to have a reading right away. And I do sort of through the writing of the play, but when I feel like, oh, this is really a first draft, I make a, a pot of chili and I invite actor friends to come over and read it out loud. And I want it to be sort of very much mm -hmm. not in the hands of someone who I hope one day will produce it or, mm -hmm. um, or even quite yet somebody who I want desperately to direct it. I, I just want it to be in the world of my of, of family. I mean, I think that for me, there is a moment when the play is done mm -hmm. where I kind of go, oh, now do we have to produce it? <laughs> you know, because it's like... Uh, Why do you say that? Well, because it's, it's sort of, it's just mine at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, then, and then the process of production, it gains a, a lot of other collaborators. And it's always, you know, I mean, I've had great experiences collaborating. I'm right. obviously always happy. But there is, you know, there's a moment that it's like, okay, I guess, you know, this has to go not even be born yet but yeah, just yeah. Uh, begin to relate to other people so right. would you say that it, the your favorite part of the process is the solitary writing part um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite I mean I think I, I, I really like the solitary writing part right. and I really like the social part but they're two very different you know you have to kind of have to make that transition mm -hmm. right and sometimes just there's right. a moment before making that transition mm -hmm. that feels like yeah like I'm still in the womb yeah. Everybody, <laughs> writing <laughs> teachers always talk about writing every day. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, often writers, teachers do. Right. right. Do you write every day? I do not write every day. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> well, you don't, maybe you don't write every day when you're in production. 
Yeah, but I mean, even, I mean, I, sometimes I don't write, like, even when I'm not in production, if yeah. there's, there's usually some reason for it. But right. if I don't write for a couple of weeks or something and I go back to it, sometimes I feel really good about that. I feel yeah. like I've got a little extra energy. Yeah. What do you, what is it, what I want to know what they mean by writing every day? Because I think people get hung up on I, rules, you know, mm -hmm. like you must write every day. You have to wash your hands before you <laughs> leave the bathroom. Right. You know? Whoa! And I think maybe we unpack the, what does it mean to write every day? Does it mean to work on the play that you hope to have your friends buy for the chili to read? Or does it mean, what does it mean, you think? Yeah, I think yeah. about that too because yeah. sometimes I have an idea and I take out my Blackberry and I type it in the notes section and I, I yeah. don't think I would ever actually yeah. call that writing. I pretty much live in a very guilty place around that, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to be one of those people who wakes up at six and writes every, like, how does Joyce Carol Oates do that, you know? I want to be that. You do that? I'm not Joyce Kelly. Well, God you, bless her. God well, bless her. But I am. We know freak. that. We know you write every day because you do that. 365. I mean, that's that's not <laughs> even in the closet. It's a tick. It's, a, it's like scratching. Yeah. Um, um, no, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes, but why I'm really, guilty? really. Uh, well, I think I feel guilty about it because we've set ourselves up. It's sort of like you were yeah. saying, unpacking this notion of what a process has to be. Right. And so, yes, sometimes I feel, particularly because people say, oh, my God, you're prolific. You must write every day. Right. And it, so it feels shameful to say, well, actually. And then lately, I think over the last, not, not I think, for sure, over the last three years, I have actually have really profoundly, deeply not been prolific. And, um, and trying to figure out how, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how to be okay with right. that. Yeah. Um, and what I can feel is that, uh, that percolating that I was saying that has to do with finding, w uh, c being comfortable walking into the next place that the play comes from mm -hmm. is what's happened there. Focus shifted to life mm -hmm. um, in a very real way. And I think I've accumulated a certain level of perspective that's going to burst forward in the work. But I, I took a writing hiatus. All the while thinking, right. I was writing just slowly and feeling very guilty. I don't feel that's it. the guilt thing is what troubles. I mean, because I I write every day, but then I'm, you know, I like getting up in the morning. I do all these. Th I mean, do you like getting up in the morning? I love getting up in the morning. Oh, you love getting. Okay, so but if you didn't love getting up in the morning, would you feel guilty? Well, you know, then that goes to <laughs> I'm just work trying to that, you know, like, I what feel like we need my therapist here now to have oh, that oh, conversation. Oh, well, 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 because, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> because maybe I, you know, reside comfortably in a certain amount of guilt, and that's just my thing. I don't know. Well, if it makes you feel better, I went uh, 10 years without writing an original new play. So, um, and did you feel guilty that, about it? But, 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 really? but I love what you're saying. I mean, I'm just because people mm -hmm. are wa people are watching, and the, they're going to put this in a can and unpack it, and so people can see it. So, you went 10 years without writing an uh, original well, an original play. full length new play. Yes. I mean, right. I wrote other things. I wrote. I, I mean, I wrote musicals. I wrote movies. Tell I, us so the titles. We want to know. Because we didn't get to well, do. We didn't get yeah, to do your bio. You had this bio, all like right. fabulousness. Oh about no! I, I mean, know. for you know, for uh, the 10 years between. <laughs> we all know. Everybody <laughs> knows. On. But do come it. On, come okay. on. Uh, okay. Uh, no, I mean, I, I wrote. Well, and Butterfly happened in 1988. Right. And then I wrote a play called Face Value in 1993, right. which right. closed in previews on Broadway. Sort of a famous flop. And then, um, then I didn't do another full-length play again until Golden Child, which was on Broadway in 98. Right. And then I spent um, time doing, I mean, a l I had a really good time working on some musicals, um, Aida and uh, right. Revision of Flower Drum Song exactly. and, uh, and Tarzan. And then I kind of got back into writing plays and right. you know, did Yellow Face a couple years ago and now right. it's English. Right. So, I mean, I always feel like I write a play because I feel like I need to write that right. play. Right. And there are certain right. times exactly. when I don't feel like I need to write a play. Exactly, exactly. And, and people watch, and they should know that. that yeah. It's not, I mean, I don't get up in the morning and write every day because I feel like a, a real writer gets up every morning and writes every day. I just get up every morning and write every day because I like to. Well, I know I like that I feel, maybe, maybe when I talk about guilt, because I think that, came, that sounds a little too heavy, I think it's a similar guilt around, oh, I will, I will work out today and I've never worked out in my life, and I'm okay with that. But I, I don't think that, I, that I'm, when I talk about guilt, there's not like shame connected to it. And that's important because I don't want my, I never want my students to think that there's a certain kind of way, a certain sort of process that you have to have. But I do think it feels better when I exercise. It feels better when I write. 
And that's the thing with music, too. And you play. Hey, I, I, I was a jazz violinist for a long time, and I've started to pick it up a little more lately. Because well, I always like to say, are you, are you playing it again? <laughs> but, but that's the thing about the music. And what did Pablo Casal say? You know, after one day, I, after one day of not practicing, I know. Two days of not practicing, my friends know. Three days of not practicing, the world knows. Or maybe it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. But the just keeping your the hand muscles. in. I think so. And there's something about keeping your hand in as a writer. And if we lower our expectations about what writing every day means, mm -hmm. it could include the notes on the Blackberry or the iPhone, my personal thing. But, you know, it can include those notes. It can include scribbling on the post-it. Mm -hmm. It could include gazing at the title of your new play that's on the wall, you know, for 15 minutes. That could be writing every day, I think. Um, yeah. Just for, you know, folks Absolutely. coming up, you know, I mean, just to kind of, yeah. yeah. No, I think it takes a while to j for a play to gestate. Definitely. Um, Definitely. And, you know, and yeah. that, that, that's a sort of work also. I think there's also something about how, um, for me, how the dynamics in the world when it's a contemporary piece mm -hmm. shift uh, the work. So the pl I was writing, I have been writing for the last three years a play that was very much about race, and I didn't realize until post-Obama that it was very much about pre-Obama and post-Obama, but I needed Obama to be in, in office in order to understand sort of what happened between the time elapse of between the first act and between the second act. I didn't know while I was writing it slowly that that's what I was waiting for, but that's what I was waiting for. The other thing that's extraordinary about this, this fall is um, not only are there 70 American plays, right. but you know there are um, Three are by women, two are by African American women, one's by you know an Asian American man. Uh, then the, the number of, of women uh, directors and minority directors also. Um, oh. Lee Silverman often says that when she did well on Broadway, she right. was like the sixth woman to have done a show on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And you know I think there's like six women uh, this fall alone directing. Wow. So, cool. um, I guess my question is, you know, I, I I often feel there's this when you're kind of a visible minority. Right. And you're, you become, you have, get some prominence in a field that's not normally associated with that minority. Right. Then all of a sudden, um, like, I feel like I became for a while the official Asian American. Right. You know, and then Amy Pan <laughs> was the official Asian American for a while. Um, and, I, I, and I've gone back and forth a lot about right. this, this sort of, how do I like that? And mm -hmm. do I like being a role model? Um, mm -hmm. um, what do you guys think? I like being a role model? Um, my parents uh, used to say, because we, my father was in the army, so we lived all over the world, and my parents would say, um, you are the ambassador of your race, they said, because often, 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 we were living in places where people had literally never seen in the flesh a person of African descent. Um, so they would say that, and now I take it to mean you are an ambassador of the human race, you know. So I don't have any problems representing the question is, what am I representing, and how do I represent? And I am calling, I call for everybody to represent, not just folks who have plays on Broadway, yay, mm -hmm. but folks who come to see those plays, and people who, Absolutely. you know, people who are, you know, build beautiful buildings and do construction work and all that. We're all representing. We're all role models. I don't. But the cool thing is, is that, you know, people of color, like women of African descent, who are playwrights, don't behave all one way. Well, that's the thing. And that's the thing that Nor is the now. aesthetic going to be, you know, exactly. predicated upon that we came out with melanin. Exactly. It's so exactly. interesting. I think one of the things you were saying, that being the one of the moment, mm -hmm. that's the one I find really curious and interesting, too, mm -hmm. that this notion, as I'm sure how many times mm -hmm. have you been called the next, and, you know, the next whatever Isn't brown it? person became before you, it's a huge compliment. And it's sort of part of that notion that if we are brown people mm -hmm. or not white, mm -hmm. um, we only have a, a limited number of footsteps to step into. Mm -hmm. and, um, and people have a very narrow parameter of how they're supposed to embrace your work and what the work is supposed to be. And we have a, also have a very narrow parameter of how we should embrace our work and what our work is supposed to be. Sometimes. Often, I would say, with you know, 
uh, often we also, I mean, not we. we not know, we, the but, artists, but, you mean we. No, not, not, the, uh, not the artists, but we meaning audiences, we meaning community, mm. have a very narrow, you know, we get, I, you know, there's the phrase, you're not black enough. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean, you know? Or you're not whatever enough, you know? So and I think that, the, I think some of what that is about, yeah. and I'm so interested to hear what you think about, so interested yeah. to hear what you think about this, <laughs> but I think what some of that yeah. is about is that sadly, uh, a range of our stories don't get told very often and particularly on stages that mm -hmm. lots of people get to see or stages yeah. that have traditionally been considered high status whatever that means I don't you know um, and so the onus is then upon gets put upon the playwright to have to tell the story that everyone's been burning to see told Th everyone needs to have to see themselves represented and so I'm angry because you didn't represent me the way I was in this moment needing to be represented. I think that is understandable, but unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And I feel like one of the things that's uh, interesting is, you know, if you don't come from a whatever minority ethnic community, right, right. Um, the, uh, th there's not necessarily the realization mm -hmm. that a lot of times the most virulent criticism that you get is from <laughs> within, within your own community. Um, you know, I, when I did my first play, FOB, at the public, right. um, there was a, a, a community, uh, Asian American newspaper in San Francisco, uh -huh. that wrote that it um, set Asian America back 20 years. And I was only 23. Well, that's a lot of time. power. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> so, you know, I was only 23. Well so done. 20 years. Like back when I was three. Yeah. But, wow. um, you know, but it sort of taught me early on that, okay, yeah. this, is, this yeah. is part of the landscape of right. what this is going to be right. about. Right. And Lydia, I think you're absolutely right. It's because when you have a community of people mm -hmm. that aren't used to seeing themselves portrayed right. in sort of ma any mainstream sense, right. then um, everybody, of course, expects that the story is supposed to be about them. Yeah. Right. You know, right. and it's right. impossible for a single writer to represent a community. It's only a community of writers that can represent a community. Right. And I actually do feel a great sense of responsibility um, to first not overly critique my fellow writers around what the story they're deciding to tell is and and sort of teaching my students to have tolerance around the stories that we need to tell and tell their own stories you can spend a lot of creative energy spinning about something that someone else didn't write the way you'd like it to be or a way that history wasn't presented the way you feel history happened then you know write that um, but I have a lot of patience for um, what I see as a, a huge problem around how little room there is for um, contemporary, complicated um, people on stage. It does seem to me that when I see brown people on stage more often than not, um, and thank you for changing that a lot, um, we're represented in a historical way and very much the central theme is about the the foot of the white man on our necks mm -hmm. M more often than not I, I think that we all have a comfort zone with that for reasons we could unpack all day mm -hmm. but i you know i yeah. also it sells well there it is yeah and also <laughs> i'm just let's bring but out some of those but it, it sells, sells because of those uncomfortable comfort zones well it, it's the sells politics and, of it and we have survived this long in this country because we uh people of African descent are, you know, based on our marketability. So if you look way back, you know, if we're marketable, we can stay alive. If we can, you know, and uh, that, and so it's, it's, it's kind of, ooh, it's in the ground water really deep. Absolutely. And I've been sort of trying to, you know, untangle I, it for, for a long time. I as think have we've all been chipping away yeah. at it, but I think that also because, mm -hmm. because it exists, yeah. um, it becomes difficult to navigate it. It's slippery. And mm -hmm. I've found that perceptions and the reality of what you thought you were trying to do creatively mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. uh, I know what I'm saying, you almost can't get it right because there is so much pressure to represent in a specific way. Yeah. Or, or you, you can get it right and you write it down. Well, I think I, mean, I, I, think get I get always right. get it right. Yeah, well, uh, well, you get, I mean, you get it right for that show, that piece, whether it's, something that, you know, springs out of your own thing or you're working on with other, you know, other, it's a Well, when I say you right. can't get it right, I, I think that whatever I've written, 
that I've decided is good enough to put into the world, I, I feel I've gotten it right. right. When I say you can't get it right, I'm saying because we have masses of people who are frustrated and underrepresented, um, you can't take care of every single one of those people with any one play. That's what I mean by you can't well, get you know, it right. I, I, maybe I've just gotten sort of philosophical about this, and it's, it's a way to uh, keep writing. But mm -hmm. I, I've actually come to feel like, you know, the, the kind of discussions and debates that go on around these plays or movies right. or books or whatever are actually a pretty good thing. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, what it, it's, I feel like it's about audience members mm -hmm. looking at work and going, well, I identify with that story, and I don't identify with that right, story. Right. And that's really about what art's supposed to do. I think it's supposed to, right. you know, the audience is supposed to be kind of the final piece. Right. And right. then they learn something about themselves right. in, in making those determinations. I mean, right. we're all used to aesthetic criticism. Mm -hmm. And I think you grow up in this culture thinking if you're an artist, you're going to, have, you're going to be critiqued aesthetically. Right. What's different is that we also get critiqued on content. Right. And, but I don't inherently think one is worse than the other. Oh, I think it's really important. And it's where the politics and art live very comfortably with each other, but also where there's a tension, mm -hmm. wh which I think is really important. For, for me, it's yeah. important. But that, that's what I meant about getting it right. You, you write it down. That, I mean, it's, it's literally that, that you're, you're right. If you are, you know, get your play done or your book written or whatever, and you stimulate some kind of conversation, then you, ha you, you did get it right. Absolutely. Um, and it's not, I mean, oftentimes, I mean, my students ask me, do you write with the audience in mind? You know, and I'd say, well, not really, because on any given day, on any given show, you've got a thousand seat house if you're lucky, and you can't, you know, it, you're not trying to read the minds of those thousand people, so you're not trying to serve a thousand people you've never met. And I've, I've sometimes made central in the work right. the question and the conversation with the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, I have sometimes made a, th uh, a thematic point of saying, I know you're white, and I'm black, and I have, and and I am going to play with the way we're going to talk about this thing, or I know that you're white and you're sitting next to somebody who's black and you're sitting next to somebody who's Asian, and when we have these conversations on stage, you're having those conversations. I like actually being aware of that tension too, sometimes in the work, but it varies from play to play. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, it's a sort of content version of meta-theatricality. I mean, just yes. sort of being aware that we're in a theater mm -hmm. and also taking into mm -hmm. account the composition of the audience, what the audience might be thinking about right. what they're seeing on stage. Right. No, um, cool. You know, I have, I have this strange theory, which is that um, I feel like all writers who get to have some prominence get, or most writers get typecast in one way or another. Mm -hmm. They may not be typecast according to ethnicity, but if you think of a Sam Shepard play, or you think of a David Mamet play, yeah. you're thinking of a particular type of play. And I also happen to, this is just recently, I've started to feel mm -hmm. like, you know, the writers who don't get typecast right. don't get written about as much. In a way, their careers are, are, are harder to handle because like critics kind of can't get a, right. a, an easy label on right. it. Right. Um, and I guess it's what we would now call branding, right. which is you know, a term that we didn't use that way when I started right. out. Right. But I don't, do you think that that, I mean, A, do you think there's any validity to that? And B, do, do you think there is a legitimate parallel between, okay, you know, I'm, an a I'm called an Asian American writer. Right. And David Mamet is thought of as a writer who you know, writes with a lot of swear words and, and you know, machismo. Uh, is there any, is that parallel at all or no. equivalent or no, not? No, it's not equivalent. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come, you said it yourself. I mean, wow, you're an Asian American, you're thought of as an Asian American writer and David Mamet is thought of, uh, and I was yeah. waiting for you, a writer who writes with a lot of swear words. We don't always oh. have the, we don't no. have I mean, the, um, we, oh, we, we don't very often get to be defined by our aesthetic. Mm. More often than not, we're going to be the black playwright. Uh, which I think is really interesting, mm -hmm. but that's what I found but more I, often. I think you know. it's. I I I think that it can start in every conversation. I really do. I mean, that's a change can begin. You know. So how would you? I want to hear. You know. How would you like if you had to brand? What's the What's the David Henry Wong brand? 
Come on, I want to. Like, I mean, well, you asked us yeah, the question. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, I find, what's the brand? What's the brand? I guess I feel like I'm writing about kind of the fluidity of identity, uh -huh. mm -hmm. like okay. how you okay. can, you know, you think you're one person, uh -huh. and then uh, you get put in a different social context, uh, and you can become someone right. else, someone that right. you didn't necessarily know you were, or who, that those aspects that you wouldn't have recognized in yourself. Right. And I think that that certainly applies in a lot of the east-west work that i do right, but it also right. kind of applies in the in the you know like tarzan, other stuff that i do or, or, or aida tarzan, yeah tarzan's basically an asian american story as far as i'm concerned <laughs> uh, but you know it's about the, a guy <laughs> it's about a guy and he's, you know, he's like born and adopted into a different culture and he grows up and he assimilates and he it's thinks great. he's that's what he is and right, then these right. other people his, right. his original group shows up and he has an identity crisis right all right but that's, I think that's cool that we, <laughs> that. That we are the, we are, like they said in Henry, like they said in Henry V, uh, you know, we are the makers of manners, Kate, uh, mm -hmm. not that you're Kate, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We are the makers of manners, so let us... Define ourselves? Yeah, let us define, yeah. let us say what our brand is. And by us saying it, maybe we can hip those out there to expand their notion of what our brand okay, might be. Well, what brand? I think is, what, what I find exciting is that I think that as there are more of us, right. it becomes trickier for people to brand us in, in too simple a way, because right. if, if they're, right. you know, if you've got Katori right. and Lynn, and it, it becomes harder mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. sort of be dismissive. You're, you know, I don't know. Well, they have, the, there, there's a, um, a requirement of specificity. I think that's what's great about it. You know what I mean? I think we have to, if you have, so you can't say, oh, they're the black women playwrights kind of thing, or they're the black playwrights. Because if you have more than one, you have, or I love, uh, the Oprah Condoleezza, you know, matrix thing that happened because suddenly people couldn't say, "What do black women think about?" Because you get asked that all the time. And you go, "Well, we've got Oprah, and we've got Condoleezza. What you talking about?" Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that became really fun because suddenly we had to be specific. You know, I mean, maybe they thought the same thing about something. So, what's your brand? You know, um, um, history, hair. <laughs> no, I'm just making shit up. And shoes. Um, and she, oh, yes. Uh, like oh, she's, oh, yes. These yes. shoes. They're yes. Yes, they're red. They're beautiful. They're red. That bought me some time. Um, I think the intersection of history and the present day, maybe. And, you know, language. Yeah. Or people who do this. <laughs> I think I'm I the think girl who's evident. not from New York. It's in, I mean, it's actually interesting um, with the branding thing and the, and the talking about careers thing. That uh, My career has been 20 years in the regional theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, new, I'm new, with the exception of a, a short run of The Bluest Eye, which was at the Steppenwolf. I'm new to this town, but not to playwriting. And in the various cities where I've been produced a lot, I've been branded there. But I, I kind of get to come to New York unbranded. So I guess I'll be the the person who writes plays about the complications and intersections of class and race <laughs> and I'm from Chicago. Also experimental. Mm -hmm. And Boston. Oh, and Boston. And Boston. Yay, Boston. Experimental. I'm still experimental. I think after Top Dog everyone thought I was going to do another Broadway play. Mm -hmm. When you say experimental, how do you define that? I wake, I, you know, every, people have said we can't put you in a box because every single play that you do doesn't look like you came yeah. before. You My know, a Top Dog and 365 do not resemble each other too much, except it's history in the present day. And well written. Yeah, yeah well. You're welcome. But I think I think that of mine too. Yeah. I um I like um, that maybe what I uh, what people have said is I can tell that it's a Lydia Diamond play because it touches me in the same places, and the writing is of a certain caliber or quality. Um, but beyond that, they're so stylistically, structurally mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I always try to do, uh, do something new form-wise in a play. Yeah, yeah. So that Yellowface is kind of a, uh, a stage mockumentary. Right. Uh, right. And an right. unreliable auto autobiography. And right. then, you know, in right. English, I'm doing a bilingual play. Right. So so I think, you know, yeah, we do, yeah. hopefully, we're, we continue to grow and we continue right. to kind of try new things. Right. And speaking of Broadway, so what does it mean to have a, 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 a show on Broadway? What does it, no, what does it mean to have a show on Broadway in 1988? 
your play, your, was it your? M. Butterfly was in, on Broadway in 1988. And that was, my, uh, that, <laughs> that was my Amazing. first Broadway show. And I'd done three or four plays at the public yeah, before right, then. Right, right, right. Um, you know, I remember just being happy to be on Broadway. I felt that there was something great about, it was, I felt like I didn't have anything to lose. Right. Because right. I'd written this play that was, you know, it, in retrospect, okay, it's a Broadway play, but right. at the time seemed like a really yeah. risky thing. Yeah. A play about a French diplomat who falls in love with a Chinese actress who turns out to be A, a spy, and B, a man in drag. Right. It didn't, you know, right. Variety, when right. we were out of town, wrote, this is not Broadway material. Oh, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and you um, won the Tony. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, I then I won the Tony. Them. Yes. Yeah, and, right. and, and <laughs> it, 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 it turned out to be quite, quite worked out well. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, Lydia, this is your first time on Broadway. I mean, you're not only new to New York, you're relatively, you're, you're, you're right. new to Broadway. And, you know, I think we who are playwrights mm -hmm. know that Broadway represents a really narrow slice of mm -hmm. the, the theatrical work that goes around mm -hmm. in the country and that many great works that will stand the test of time aren't going to make it to Broadway. Absolutely. And yet, you know, it's all kind of, I mean, most of us aspire to Broadway in some sense or another as well. So how come? What is it about Broadway? Um, I didn't actually aspire to Broadway, and I, that sounds precious, and I, it's not. I just, it wasn't part of um, the paradigm that I was given for what a career looks like and what to expect. Part of that, I think, does have to do with coming up in Chicago um, artistically, because there's the, this, the um, ecology of theater in Chicago is relatively insular and non-hierarchical. So um, I, did, I, I wasn't looking to that, which, is, which makes this experience both really, really exciting, but I'm still, I get asked that question at every interview and I'm still sort of uncomfortable in it um, because yes, it's hugely exciting and it certainly is the thing that everyone assumes you've always, always aspired to and it certainly is something to, um, to be thankful, to be grateful for. So, but what does it mean to you? Is it the exposure? Is it the chance that you might be able to actually make some money on a play? Is it um, mm -hmm. that you... That's a nice idea, and even that, you know, it feels a little bit like gambling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. At the, we just had our first, uh, our open dress rehearsal last night. Okay. Thank you. So I have no idea of if this means any kind of financial anything for me. I don't know what's going to happen, and I think that's new because in the rehearsal room, the work is the same work that I've, you know, even with many of the same people that I've been in rehearsal rooms with for a long, long time, um, all of the Broadway stuff seems to be a little more external, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm still metabolizing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and are you still rewriting during previous? Very little. The play has, has been alive for six years, so it's relatively tight and ready to go. Um, so, yes, the nudgy little changes that you make because uh, it comes out of an actor's mouth weirdly over and over and over again, and, um, uh, I, you know, little things that I can feel need to be trimmed and all, you know, just the regular little stuff, but it's not, it, it wasn't in process because I've had such a, a long time to, mm -hmm. to tighten and it. Can you just describe Stick Fly for the, uh, any viewers that haven't, uh, who are sure. waiting to see it or haven't <laughs> sure. seen it? Sure. Stick Fly is a play that's set on Martha's Vineyard. Um, a young woman goes home to meet her fiance's family for the first time. They're a moneyed family who's had this home on the vineyard for generations and generations and generations. And, um, and it's a very traditional telling of a story, but um, yeah, she's um, the daughter of a famous public intellectual who has recently died, um, with whom she never had a relationship. He had divorced her mother. And, um, and so she has uh, sort of uh, daddy issues, um, but also the, the marginalization of being both very, very privileged um, and having access, but growing up without a lot of money and resources, um, and the way those things. So it's it's a class clash, but it's a more subtle and nuanced one than we usually get to see. She's not, you know, I'm not going to do it. But she, and then also there's a young woman who's the um, stepping in as the maid for her mother, who's not there that weekend. And there's a, a brother of the son, and you know stuff happens. And like I said, this was my experiment of writing like a well-made mm -hmm. uh, little chestnut of a play, and it is interesting because people 
do like that. I don't think I have another one of those in me in that way, but it was a nice experiment. It's worked out well. <laughs> um, so Susan Laurie, you're doing a musical this season. Um, you're rewriting the book for the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Yeah. Um, and I, I rewrote a book once on, uh, for Rodgers and Hammerstein's Flower Drum Song, and right, I found it right. a particular challenge because in some sense my collaborators First, I, I'd never written a musical before at the time I did Flower Drum Song. Right. I just wanted, I didn't know that I wanted to do musicals. I just wanted to do Flower Drum Song. Oh. But, um, cause, uh, but then I, f and I thought, oh, you know, this won't be, this will be relatively, you know, easy because my collaborators aren't around anymore. And I feel like directors always do this. Directors right. always work with, right. you know, wonderful artists who aren't around anymore. Right. And then I found, actually, it's really hard because mm -hmm. the, the collaborators aren't around anymore, but uh, I, the, their DNA mm -hmm. exists in the songs, you know, right. and the songs are all, right. all need to do specific things. And because they're not around, they can't change anything. Right. Um, right. So, are you, how do you find the particular challenge of rewriting a book? I really, really, I'm enjoying myself tremendously. I, I, I find I, I'm thrilled that the Gershwins and Debose Haywards and the Haywards actually, because it's Dorothy and. DuBose are around, as you said. I'm thrilled that they're still around because what we do, what we do, <laughs> what I do with this, the, the, the sort of spirit of these, these wonderful writers, uh, we uh, make new things. And I, I'm thrilled that they're still around, but I can still feel their DNA in the songs and the words in the story. Um, and I work with it and I mix it with mine and we make little. Are you still, I got to see it in yeah. um, Cambridge, yeah, Massachusetts. Yeah. I thought it was lovely. I thought it was beautiful. Thank and you, so, actually, it really blew me away. So um, are you still, you, you, with yeah, it? I mean, you, yeah, you yeah, spoke in the present sure, tense. Sure, sure, we're, we're, fu we're fussing with it. Um, the, not big futzes, but we're tweaking it, you know. We go, um, we're, we're still working on it. We'll probably work on it. I mean, Diane Paulus, the director, is such a hard-working, awesome director woman that I will work on it until, right up until, you know, it's, well, it's time to let it go, <laughs> uh, which is not necessarily uh, the opening night thing. But, um, but I really enjoy getting in there and working with, uh, I, I, working with established, beautiful. And how did, and, and so this call yes. to do this was yes. literally a call. It was an actual phone call, And yeah. just tell us about how that, how no, the collaboration well, like this comes about. Yeah, well, Diane Pulse from, from ART, a wonderful director, called me up, and the Gershwins had contacted her uh, th through the producer, Jeffrey Richards, and they said, we'd like to um, work on Porgy and Bess. It's a wonderful opera, uh, and we'd like to create a musical for the you know musical theater stage. We'd like to do that, and so we uh, would like you to call up a book writer person and she called me and said, you want to work on Porgy and Bess? And I said, um, you know, the Gersons want us to work on it. So basically it was at their request that we do this work. And I said, um, how many other writers are you thinking of? And she said, just you. I'm just talking to you. So I said, okay, I'm in. Like that. And uh, So we've all been doing this for a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's worth looking at, you know, what are the survival strategies? Like, what's important in terms of being able to um, continue being creative, mm -hmm. to continue having a career? Mm -hmm. um, what have you found that's useful? Because sure. I, I don't think people know yeah. how playwrights make a living. I would say to writers or, or artists, of, you know, coming up, um, you know, embrace hard work. Embrace that sort of whether you get up every morning and write or whatever, you know, it, just just know that you're going to have to apply yourself and you're going to have to give continuously, continually to your art form. And because uh, a lot of times, a lot of people coming up to see, you know, reality TV and figure you don't have to do anything to do that, you mm -hmm. know, but to be. And you don't. <laughs> To well, do that. Well, 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 somebody has but, to edit. Yeah, so that it looks like it has but, a story. But you know, but, but really, to sort of just embrace the, the, the you know, to embrace that, that. Yeah, I think work. hard work is really important. Yeah. I feel like there's three things that go into a career that okay. you need to have talent, and okay. then you need to have um, uh, uh, some luck. Yeah, yeah. And you need to work hard. Yeah. And you really can't <laughs> control the talent and luck part right. so much. Right. So you can really only control the. You, know, you can. You can right. work hard. Right. I'm a huge proponent also in self-production. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yes. I just think put that play up in your living room, in your church, in a basement. Uh, it's unlikely that someone's going to come looking for you for your play and ask you to, to, to do it. 
Um, and so I think that some of that luck can happen because you're putting your, your work into the universe. I agree with that. Like you work your luck, you make your luck. And I think uh, love for your art form and hard work at it begets a talent for it. So I mm -hmm. think there are things that you can, yeah. that, that hard work can actually fuel those two things too. Yeah. I have a little prayer oh. that I, or a mantra, that it came to me one day, uh, I was actually in Hong Kong one day, and oh. my career wasn't, you know, it was one of the points where it wasn't going so well. And I just, I, I was walking across the bay and I thought, you know, whatever happens, I hope I just don't become bitter. I never want to become bitter. Do you have a do you have a prayer or mantra? I just want to be able to keep going, keep on keeping on, like they used to say. I want to have um, my success not defined by others. I want to always be fulfilled just doing the work. And it sounds Pollyanna-ish, but I I feel most like the artist I want to be when, I, and when I'm shutting out all of the external noise. Great. Well, it's been really fun just to be able to sit around yeah, awfully free good playwrights. At this. <laughs> and, oh, thanks. And, uh, and talk. And um, thank you for being here today uh, at the American Theatre Wing. It's an honor. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm David Henry Huang, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theatre, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theatre television programs which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.